It's seven o'clock on Thursday, the 26th of March. This is Chrissy Jackson at breakfast and your main story today. A Norfolk man infected with the hepatitis C through contaminated blood in the 1980s is bitterly disappointed with the findings of a public inquiry. A lot of haemophiliacs have died over this. A lot have had their lives cut short. The long-term prognosis for me with the liver transplant is not massive. It would be nice to have some sort of financial security and the last sort of quality of life that you can have left. The Penrose inquiry said although the impact on the victims and their families had been devastating, there was little that could have been done differently. And we'll hear Steve's story next. A man from Norfolk infected with hepatitis C through contaminated blood in the 1980s is bitterly disappointed with the findings of a public inquiry. The six-year Penrose inquiry looked into the problems that led to NHS patients in the 1970s and 80s becoming infected with HIV or hepatitis C. It concluded that although the impact on the victims and their families had been devastating, there was little that could have been done differently. Earlier we heard what haemophilia meant for Steve Sillett from Brockdish as he grew up. He was put on a course of injections called Factor 8. It was then discovered they were contaminated with hepatitis C. After going in for an ankle operation, he was told about the contamination, but was yet to find out the full consequence of it. We knew nothing about it. It was quite a devastating fact to find out. We weren't told initially where it had come from. That wasn't until about two or three months afterwards, after asking questions, that they said that there was a possibility that there was some contamination within the factor that I'd been using. I cleared hepatitis C with the six months of treatment, but it had left my liver um, cirrhosis. I was diagnosed with liver cancer and told I'd probably got around about 12 months. The only course of action that I'd got open was really was a liver transplant. So I was then referred to Addenbrooke's one month ago. I was um, being prepared for the operation. What are your thoughts, having heard the, the apology from the Prime Minister? I'm not sure whether, an, whether the apology was sincere. It didn't look sincere particularly to me. The 25 million transitional, what does that mean? Are we being fudged yet again after 30 years? I don't know. Has it brought you any comfort at all? None whatsoever, really, at the end of the day. I mean, it's six years and £12 million, and it seems like Penrose has come out with one recommendation that anyone prior to 1991 having a blood transfusion should have a hepatitis C test. That doesn't answer any of the questions that us haemophiliacs have been uh, infected with HIV and hepatitis C. It's answered none of them, and we know there's evidence out there that proves the case to be true. And at the end of the day, someone made that decision. Someone should be held accountable for this. There's £25 million to be put towards it. It's not entirely clear exactly where that money will go and how it will be used. Is money the answer? When you think that uh, a lot of haemophiliacs have died over this, a lot have had their lives cut short. The long-term prognosis for me with the liver transplant is not massive. It would be nice to have some sort of financial security and the last sort of quality of life that you can have left. Are you surprised that the Penrose report has, has only come out with one recommendation? I'm shocked, actually, yes, as you say, after six years and the amount of information and, and evidence that they've had that blood was imported and, and it was contaminated and they knew it was contaminated, it's just shocking that they've come out with just that one thing. And that one thing just really at points just seems insignificant, to be quite honest. And for you, the future then, what do you hope will happen and how do you think that will transpire in in the coming months and years? I'd like a few more answers as as to where and why it all went wrong. I know that's not going to help at this precise moment in time and I've been probably one of the luckier ones that I've actually got away with this uh, to a point at any rate. It would be nice to have some form of compensation so if anything happens to me in the meantime or this liver transplant goes wrong that I know my wife is going to be okay because obviously I'm down on earnings because I can't earn as what I could earn and um I'm probably not going to be able to go back to work on a full-time basis, so therefore my income's going to be down. I can't get a pension because I've had the um, hepatitis and all the rest of it. So some form of financial security, really, for, for the wife would be lovely, but that doesn't look like that's going to happen in the short term. 
Oh, that's Steve Sillett from Brockdish. Well, David Cameron has apologised to the thousands of patients who were infected with hepatitis C and HIV through contaminated blood supplies in the 1970s and 80s. The government has also committed an extra £25 million of support to patients. This is after a major inquiry into the case, said by some to be the worst treatment and scandal in the history of the NHS. The Prime Minister told the Commons yesterday that what happened was unfair, causing needless pain and suffering. To each and every one of those people, I would like to say sorry on behalf of the government for something that should not have happened. No amount of money can ever fully make up for what did happen, but it's vital we move as soon as possible to improve the way that payments are made to those infected by this blood. And after eight o'clock this morning on The Breakfast Show, we'll be hearing from a campaign group and getting their reaction to the report and ask what they plan to do next. On the programme this morning, we've been talking about contaminated blood. It's after a report by a public inquiry in Scotland into the contamination of NHS blood supplies in the 1970s and 80s, which has described the saga as the stuff of nightmares. But it concluded few things could have been done differently. Thousands of people across Britain were infected with hepatitis C and HIV as a, re- as a result of the treatment. Earlier in the programme, we heard from Steve Sillett from DIS, who received contaminated blood in the 1970s. He says the inquiry didn't go far enough. I'd have liked to have heard more answers as to why, where. And at the end of the day, someone made that decision. Someone should be made accountable for this decision to import this blood from America, which they knew was coming from prisons and from junkies and and just about anywhere that you could get blood from. Someone should be held accountable for this. And joining me now to talk more about this is the co-chair of the organisation Tainted Blood, Sue Threkel. Sue, good morning to you. Good morning. morning. Now, Tainted Blood works to support those who were given contaminated blood products. Um, And I know that you've been fighting for a public inquiry, but what are your thoughts, first of all, on the results of the Penrose inquiry yesterday? Um, well, I've got three points that I would like to make, if I may. Um, first of all, government has spent years and years, decades, in fact, telling us consistently, every single government that's been in place has said that no public inquiry is needed. Um, they've given various reasons for this. They've said that all the relevant information is out there in the public domain, and so you wouldn't gain anything from spending the money on a public inquiry. Um, they've said that um, no wrongdoing took place, various reasons why we shouldn't have one and yet for the best part of the last 12 months or so they have um on their own by their own admission held up um any sort of final settlement for sufferers on the basis of awaiting the results of a public inquiry albeit in scotland in the written ministerial statement yesterday they said we had hoped to consult during this parliament on reforming the ex gratia financial assistance schemes considering, among other options, a system based on some form of individual assessment, which is one of the things that we've been pushing for on and off anyway. Um, I I find it completely ironic, so frustrating, that having spent 30 years campaigning, partly for a public inquiry, they then hold up what sounds like a reasonable plan on the basis of waiting for a public inquiry. Mm. Um, yesterday they also announced that they've given another interim payment, £24 million. Pounds. Now, if you say it quickly, it sounds a lot. But A, we don't know what it's for. They say it's to help with a transitional period between now and sometime in the next government when they will set up a new system of payments. They don't make it clear whether that money is going straight to victims or whether it's going to be used to wind up the present completely inadequate totally unfit for purpose uh, support network system which includes two charities where people literally have to go begging over and over and over again for a small grant request. Um, The the stories I hear, the the phone calls I get from people in floods of tears, you know, because their fridge has broken down, a fridge or a washing machine, something that most people would consider essential, particularly if you've got serious health needs like Steve, and they get turned down, not just once, two, three, four times. These The the support system that is in place at the moment, as I said, is wholly inadequate and needs revising. But if they have just given £24 million and they've announced it in PMQs yesterday, 
on the basis that what they're going to do is to wind up trusts which they set up in the first place and which don't work, then I find that completely immoral. We want a clarification and we're asking for this today. OK, um, but I mean, David Cameron, yeah. did he made an apology to those who received contaminated blood. Let, let's just hear what he said. And to each and every one of those people, I would like to say sorry on behalf of the government yeah. for something that should not have happened. Yeah. No amount of money can ever fully make up for what did happen, but it's vital we move as soon as possible to improve the way that payments are made to those infected by this blood. And as you say, he went on with that extra money, £25 million, I, th I think, was, was made available. So, you, I mean, your first reaction to that, Sue? Well, the first reaction there is that the money he's made available is, is only twice what the inquiries cost, less than twice, actually, because that was £12.5 million. And... When we look at what happened yesterday, I mean, I was at home sort of coordinating things here and I spent from about half past six yesterday morning to about half past one this morning um, just dealing with the fallout from it. Um, even seasoned campaigners, and I mean, people that have been campaigning for as long as me, were in floods of tears, were just sitting there shell-shocked. You know, it, it was like a kind of... Um, a sort of war zone on the laptop. That's the only way I can describe it. Well, I suppose so. Is it is this stirring personal experience up for you? Um, it does, yeah. But um, in fact, other things stir up personal experience, which is that yesterday we were not just dealing with this. We were dealing with a colleague from Tainted Blood who is desperately ill, really desperately ill, and needed to be in hospital, and they couldn't find him a hospital bed. They couldn't get an ambulance to take him to hospital. This morning, his daughter has sent me photographs of the space he's in in the hope that I can do something. We are constantly dealing with the fallout from this day in and day out. This is real families, real people that are suffering here. And yet, it was, no it was nice to hear the Prime Minister stand up and finally give an apology, and that will mean a great deal to a large number of people. Um, well, what... What do you think it's going to take to give people any kind of closure on this? As you said, it's been going on for, for 30 years. I think it will take two or three things, actually. The first thing we need is an urgent, and I can't stress how urgent, um, full and fair, a final solution to this, which I have to say has to be a financial one. They cannot bring back the dead. They can't particularly improve people's health unless they can... Um, give them full access and quick access to the newest therapies that are available, which in the case of hepatitis C seem to be quite successful. Um, yet our people are still having to fight for it. They were infected by an NHS, which is now denying them treatment. They need fast track into urgent treatment. We need a full financial settlement to pop, stop people struggling, to stop them losing their homes. We've got people here who've had to downsize, who've had to go into rented accommodation, um, people whose income, annual income, has gone down by over £60,000 a year. People who were previously in very, very high-paid jobs. OK, Sue, so, uh, we could talk to you for, for a long time. I bet you're going to be very busy talking to a lot of the media today. But Sue Threckle from Tainted Blood, thanks very much for joining us this morning.